Hello. Hi. Thanks for thanks for coming. We're there. We're at the end. It's been it's been good. Good. We're on day three, aren't we? Three three days of fun. Has it been good? Enjoyed it? Worth worth the trip? Porto is pretty cool. Who's who's not from Porto? Just out of interest. I think most people. Yeah. Who's first time here? First time here? Yeah. Good. Yeah. I enjoyed it too. I enjoyed it too. So yeah. So thanks. Um, Thanks for sticking around and, and coming along. You know, it's been it's been it's been a lot of a lot of thinking, a lot of learning. So appreciate you kind of still being here at 4:30 on the on the Friday. Um, for those who don't know me, um, I've kind of been speaking at Scala conferences for about three years now, in some shape or form. My name's Noel. Hello. Um, I work for a company, 47 Degrees. We've got the booth outside. We make the T-shirts that everyone's got. Um, when I used to do these talks, I used to say, you know, if you want to speak to us, find some of the guys in the t-shirts, but now you've all got them, so you've just got to kind of take a punt, I suppose. Um, yeah, so if you don't know what we do, we're a, we're a software consultancy, so we, we, we kind of help other clients with what they need to do, we can help in an advisory capacity, we can do some development, we do training as well, we're certified for Lightbends courses, and then we do some stuff that's maybe not Scala specific, so kind of big data, we're partners with Google Cloud, um, kind of things like that. So generally, if you, if you need something and you're in the Scala world, we, we can usually, usually help you out. Um, so I'm based in London. Um, we've got an office in southern Spain as well. We've got Jorge and Benji here from, from there. And then we've got, we've got some guys in, uh, in Seattle as well. So that's, 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 that's all the boring bit done. Okay, so um, who knows what an ADT is? Who, who doesn't know what an ADT is? Yeah? This talk's for you. Like, literally, this is going to be quite introductory. So if you know, you, you might not get some value. Maybe you will. Uh, I hope you do. Um, please don't heckle, because um, I, I, I'm not fast enough to think of witty responses to put you down. Um, but, you know, we can get through this together. If you've got questions, let me know. Uh, I'm only expecting probably to take around 30, 35 minutes, so we can get out in the sunshine before, uh, before we have the, the panel at the end. Right, so what are we going to talk about? Okay, pretty, pretty brief. We're going to have a very brief introduction of what they are. I'm not going to get into the mechanics, the mathematics, the formal definitions. That's not really where I see the value. I see the value in making this stuff practical. So that's how I'm going to do this, okay? We'll go through some ADTs, and you might not even realize they're ADTs, and then hopefully we'll start then to see where, where the value comes from this. And then at the end, um, we're going to introduce a brand new collection type using some of the, some of the newfound knowledge or, or stuff you already know um, in, in this new collection. Okay, so what is, what is an algebraic data type? Okay, so according to Wikipedia, it's this. In computer programming, especially functional programming and type theory, an algebraic data type is a kind of composite type. That is a type formed by combining other types. And that's actually a pretty good definition. So we'll see, we're just going to see lots of examples of this. And this is not to be confused with abstract data types, which is kind of a more of a hand wavy, doesn't really mean very much definition for, for other things in other paradigms and stuff like this. Okay, so ADTs. If you're if you're outside of the FP domain, people might be talking about abstract data types, and they might they might be talking about data structures or or something else. So always get clarification. Okay. So wh where's the algebra? Why? What does algebraic mean? Like what? You know this this definition. It just says look, it's types with other types in it. There's nothing about algebra here. There's nothing about numbers. Like, why, why is it called this, and we've not referred to this in the, in the definition, okay? So let's start, let's take a slight sidestep, and we'll do some counting numbers. All right, so I know, I know it's Friday, I know it's 4.30, but I need a little bit of participation. It's not, not too hard. How many different values can that type have? It's not hard, it's two, right? Okay. How many, how many integers? So again, too many. So it's, it's two to the power of 32, right? But unit, how many different values can unit have? One, okay? 
What about strings? What about lists? Right, they're infinite, yeah? We can always put an extra character on or put an extra thing in our list. Okay, what about these types? How many different values can that type have? Any idea? 2 to the 32 minus 1 times 2. You're out by 1. <laughs> it's 2 to the 32 times 2, so 2 to the 33. Because integers 2 to the 32, not 2 to the 32 minus 1. Yeah? So we've kind, of, we've kind of done a little bit of maths there, haven't we, to work that out? We got there. What about this type? How many different values can that have? I can't hear. Say again. 2 to the 32 plus 2, yeah? So, with, a, with an either, you're one type or the other, yeah? So if you're an integer, like we saw on the previous slide, like Daniela said, there's loads of them. 2 to the 32 different values. But instead of an integer, it might be a Boolean, so there's two values for that. So it's 2 to the 32 plus 2. So this one we kind of multiplied, this one we kind of added, all right? So a fancy word for multiplication is product, yeah? A fancy word for addition is co-product, yeah? It's kind of the, the jewel of a product, yeah? So if, you, um, if, you're, if you're new on your Scala journey, um, these words might be a little bit scary. And, and if you're new on your Scala journey, you might not have used libraries like Shapeless. They might be a bit intimidating, perhaps. And these, these come up all the time. Like these are kind of the, the meat of Shapeless, you know? So, that there's nothing scary about this word. It might just not be a word you're maybe too familiar with. So John Pretty did a talk. I was speaking to him about this last night, actually. He did it more than, more than once. Um, but when I, send the links around, when I send the slides around, this is actually a link. Um, and he took this to a crazy extreme. And it was based on a paper from an academic in the Haskell world. And um, he basically ends up like um, in introducing algebra and um, doing calculus on types. And then the resulting values are actually different types themselves and have reference to what was the differentiation in the first place, which is really, really quite, quite fun, actually. It's a good talk. It's, it's, it's only about 15 minutes, so I'd recommend watching it. And just as an aside, back to this, how many different values does that type have? a function from Booleans to integers. So all the different values that that function can be. Not that it can have, that it can be, yeah? So you think about it, so go on. Two, Two. no. No side effect, come on, we're, 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 we're good programmers, right? We're, we're the leaders, we're the guys who go to conferences. We, we do it properly, right? So there's no side effects here, okay? So we've got a function that goes from Boolean to integer. Well, let's, let's start by trying to work it out. So we can have an instance of this function that when it's true, when you, say again? Yes, that's right. What it is is that, so when you're, so you can have an instance of this function that when you pass it the parameter true, it returns a number, one. And when you return, when you pass it a false, it returns two. And that's, a, that's one type. That's one instance of this type. But then you could have another one where when you pass it a true, it returns minus six. And when it's a false, it returns an integer max. And so what it is, it's the return type to the power of the parameter. So yeah, two to the 33. So that's two to 32 squared. Just an aside, just, just a bit of fun. Okay, so let's come back to this. So we were looking at this earlier. Okay, what's the difference? Is there any difference? You can't see that, can you? Let's see what I can do here. Does my mouse, does this work? No, I can't even zoom in. Nope, my slides aren't great. So, um, so for those at the back, uh, it's a case class called invoice. It has two parameters. The first one is called paid, takes a Boolean. The second one is price, it takes an integer. What's the difference? Is there a difference between those two? No? 
Yeah, Who's, who thinks yes? Okay, who thinks no? You're kind of both right, really. You're kind of both right. You know, like, so you can convert from one to the other without any kind of loss, yeah? And the, the fancy word for that is isomorphism. But there's, kind of, there's a little bit more value in this, isn't there? Because, you know, we know it's an invoice. We, we know what the Boolean means. We know what this integer means. You know, but, but they're kind of the same, yeah? So, and what about this? So we've got this either, and the left side is a tuple, and the right side is a string. I wonder if we can do a similar thing to what we just did for the product, the tuple with the case class, with an either. And it's a little bit, a little bit more, more code to write. It looks something like this. So we have a sealed trait with some kind of name. For those at the back, that says database response. And then we've got a couple of case classes here. So we've got this first one, that's the same as, as on the previous slide, but it extends this trait. And then the other one is, I've called this an error message, parameter is a string, and again, this extends the database response. Are these, are these different? Are these the same? It's kind of, it's kind of the same as, as what we just saw, isn't it? Sorry, I've lost my slides there. there we go. Okay, so one thing here to note is, is this is sealed, you know, hopefully we all know what this means, right, is that we can't, we can't then create any more values of this that the compiler doesn't know about. So we have this nice, nice mechanism that the compiler knows that these are all the values that this can have. We can't come along later and then stick on some of the value in another running, you know, outside of the library and things like this. So th this is really going to be quite key as, as we move on. Another thing to notice here, or to point out rather, is I, I've, I've made this a sealed trait. Like, this could have been a sealed abstract class, like that's not important. Like, the important part is it's sealed and that these extend from this kind of abstract interface, kind of whatever, whatever that means, you know. So, when we've got some kind of instance of a database response, it's either this pairing of a string and an integer, a Boolean and an integer, sorry, or it's a string, it's one or the other, okay? So as I, as I kind of, a little bit of a recap here, we group types together, we need to have all of these types with us. We can't have half of a tuple, we need it all. And so they're called products. With either's we have one or the other and never both, and these are code products, okay? Other languages kind of make this point that these are algebraic in a little bit more detail. Is that, so say with a language like Haskell, for instance, for those who can't see, I've got some type called suit, and then these are, these are cards. But what I want to point out here is that the separator between these different values is a pipe, which is a bit like an or in programming, yeah? And then if we take a step back even further and look at ML, you start getting crosses to represent products. And that's, you know, it's the same symbol as multiplication. Okay? Oh, am I with everyone so far? I mean, hopefully this is nothing too, too taxing. Yeah? Okay? So, let's have a look at some common types. Okay, here's one. Options. Options are algebraic data types. And this code, I've pulled it straight from the Scala 212 source, kind of removed the stuff that wasn't of interest. So, options are sealed. It's a sealed type. There's no other values of option can exist outside of the file where options are defined. And then we can either have a sum or we can have a none. Okay, we've got this kind of co-product here that things are one or the other, okay? Another one, list. This is very, very similar to what we've just seen. So a list is sealed, and then we can either have an instance of a list with this kind of weird symbol, a double colon, and then we have some parameters here to, to help us construct the list, or the, or the list is empty, okay? I, I'm really not trying to do too much here. I'm just trying to say, you know, these are ADTs, and we're going to build on this, okay? Have a look at a slightly more interesting example, okay? JSON. We can model JSON as an algebraic data type, okay? And all the different fields and all the different types in the JSON world we can encode as Scala types. So we have numbers, we have booleans, we have strings, we have arrays, 
We have JSON objects. We even have a null, yeah? That's, that's valid in, in JSON. And we might find that when we write this in Scala, it might look something like this. Hope, hopefully, hopefully you can probably see enough of this. Um, so we have a sealed trait we've called JSON, and then we have a type for each of the different types and then a way to construct it, okay? Now, I, I made this up, okay? But I kind of took a lot of influence from Cersei for this. There, there are a few little differences. Um, Cersei tends to hide the constructors for other reasons, but, but you know, it's, it's the same thing. So we have this kind of algebraic property of JSON, and hopefully we're going to start to see why this might be of, of use. So like, what's the point of all this? You know, I've kind of spent, what, 15 minutes probably telling you stuff you already know. Okay, well, we got some other kind of value out of this as well. Is that, well, types are good. You know, it's better to be saying we've got this JSON thing that's a Boolean rather than a Boolean. You know, that's going to help us describe our domain and our model to other programmers to help us understand where we're using types in certain places. And then if things start leaking, it should become very clear. If we're using a JSON Boolean in a place with no JSON, you know, we start to see that, that things, where, where, where our, boundaries, our boundaries lie. These are more intuitive. You know, it makes more sense to have some kind of model for JSON than to just use a hash map with strings and any, right? We could do that, or we could go and write Ruby or Python or something like that, okay? But what we do is we have a way to have a conversation with the compiler that we are telling the compiler every possible state that our domain can be in. Okay, so with the JSON example, there's nothing else. There's no, there's no niche kind of little set that, that JSON has, and actually there's certain ways we can encode it that way. It's like, no, it's like, this is it. These are all the different ways. There's nothing else, okay? And we'll start to see why, the, why this is good and how the compiler can help us. Just an aside on the previous slide, we're coming back to this point about types are good. My, my type of invoice actually had Booleans and integers, Generally, using a Boolean as a parameter is a bit of an anti-pattern. You know, it, it's, it's not very descriptive, and it, it, it can be a bit misleading to users of your API as to, you know, what does true mean, what does false mean. You know, we could maybe do something like this. Just have a little, little ADT with a couple of marker types, and these are much more descriptive, and these are just going to make life easier for us. You know, we, we can then start to use this in a much richer way with nicer debugging and, and things like that. Okay. But there's more value as well. Okay, and this is this is where we start to get to the fun stuff now. Is that we now have a mechanism for providing a way to go from our ADT to something else. Because we've told the compiler that there are no other types that exist. So therefore we can tell we can provide an API that maps from all of these different types to some other type, and therefore we get to work in a very, very safe way with our ADTs. Okay, and this is called folding. Okay, so we might, with our kind of toy API we've been talking about, we're really looking at some kind of function like this that goes from our sealed trait database response to some other type A. Okay, and there's, there's, there's more than one way to do this. You know, this, again, this is not rocket science. It's Friday, it's quarter to five, it's hot. You know, this is not, this is not hard, okay? There are, you know, we can just pattern match. We can just go variable, match, case, invoice, do this, case, error, message, do that, okay? Or we can go one step better and we can build this functionality into our type. Okay, and this would look something like this. So we'd have a function called fold, and it's a higher order function. So it takes two parameters, which themselves are functions, and each of these parameters is a function which itself has parameters of the values that these subtypes can be. So for those who can't see it, this first function takes a Boolean and an integer and produces some kind of A. So that was this invoice type. And then the other one goes from a string to an A. So we've got this nice API now that we can give to 
the client, the people who use our API and say, if you've got a database response and you want something else, here's a nice interface for you to do this. You provide a function for dealing with invoices, you provide a function for dealing with error messages, you're gonna get an A out of it. You get to decide that A. And this is the implementation, it's really, is you kind of nothing, nothing magical here, you know. If we're in the successful case, then call the successful function, which was the invoice. Otherwise, we're in the error state, so we call the error function, and that's it. Okay. Have a think, like have a think why we want to do this over pattern matching. Like, is you know, is pattern matching not? I like pattern matching. We're going to see a lot of pattern matching soon. And I'm a bit scared because the code's small. So if you're at the back, you might want to move forward. But you know, pattern matching's good. So just have a think as to why you might want to do this instead. Mm -hmm. Is there a question? Are you in a right. So this is um, yeah. This is just a snippet of code. This is not the real thing. But you know, inside the you know, when you say this, it's the object. You know, we're calling this on an object. You know, it's going to be val dr colon database response equals something dr dot fold so this is dr okay it's your instance of your database response yeah and you'll hopefully this 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 example will make a bit more sense so we can fold with options we saw options before options are adts and this again this is lifted straight out of the 212 source code and we've got a function called fold and it takes two parameters slightly slightly different to what we just saw with our database response type is that the none case doesn't have any values any parameters so we've got this kind of thunk or you know kind of empty function or you know it's um, by name it's a by name parameter so it, if it's empty, we're going to get this if, if we're none. Otherwise, if we're the sum, we're going to do what's on the other side. Both of these give us Bs, so they take us an option of A and return us a B. Not an option of B, a B. So it's a way to get out of an option safely. And this is the implementation. If it's empty, return what was in the empty parameter. Otherwise, we do this, and this is this is how it works in Scala. So, a little exercise here is everything that you use an option for. All the other methods on options can be implemented using fold, and that's a little fun exercise. And so things might start to look like this. If we want a map, we've got two cases. If we're in the none case, we're returning a none. If we're in the sum case, we apply our function and wrap it all in a sum, and we're good to go. For each, so for each does something to the sum and returns unit, it's, just, it's side affecting, all right? And look, if we're in the none case, we'll do nothing, right? If we're in the sum case, just apply the function. We can even implement get, yeah? If we're in the none case, we do what Scala does, which might not be great, we we'll throw an exception, otherwise, we just return the parameter, we call identity, yeah? So that's just A to A, yeah? So have a bit of fun and, you know, have a look at other types, have a look at ethers, have a look at tries, have a look at Cersei JSON, they have folds on, and see if you can do similar things with those, okay? So folding JSON would look something like this, a bit more verbose, yeah? So we've got a function here, for every different type. And they're all function, they're function parameters, and they all return some kind of A. And the clients of our API say, well, you know, I've got some JSON, but I want to do something else with it. I want to persist it to a database. I want to display it nicely on the screen. I want to do something else. I don't want JSON. How do I do that? It's like, well, you give a function, you say, well, if the JSON's a double, you need to do this. If, it's a, if the JSONs are null, you need to do this, you know, and this is it. And again, just have a think here as to if there's any value in doing it this way over other ways which seem to make a bit more sense. So what's the point? What's the point? Like, 
we've done, we, we've got pattern matching. This is what I've been trying to hint at. You know, we've got pattern matching. We, 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 do we, do we need this kind of folding? Like, it just seems like a lot of noise and it just seems like a lot of effort. And the thing is, most of these folds, once, once they're more complicated than the option, you know, we saw option and it was just an if statement. But you probably find if we implemented something like the JSON, we're probably going to use pattern matching under the hood. So what are we doing? What's, you know, what's the point of all this? Okay. Well, here's, here's the point. Right. Imagine we added a new class to our database response. Something else doesn't matter what it is. And we diligently update our fold method. Okay. So here, this function here has the same parameter list of our new type. Hopefully now we see what this might be useful for. If we've been using fold throughout our code base, everything breaks. And that's what we want, yeah? We want the compiler to tell us, oh, you were using fold, and fold had two parameters that were functions, but now fold has three. And so all you have to do is just make sure you've covered this purchase request case in all your folds, and then your code will work as normal. If you had pattern matching, you're going to get a warning, yeah? And, you know, in, in, the, in, in development these days, you know, we get a lot of warnings in our code. We have large, maybe several thousand line builds. An extra warning might get missed. So maybe we need to worry about that some other way, okay? So my tip would be, let's use folding where necessary. Let's lean on the compiler, okay? But also... As an aside, if we make our compiler warnings errors, then if we're not doing this in the first place, you know, our build breaks because we've not covered all the cases in a pattern match. Okay. So of course, yeah, this is when you non-exhaustively pattern match. This is when we get this error. Okay. Right. So to so finish off we're going to generate, we're going to create our own algebraic data type. Red, black trees. Do people know what red, black trees are? Yep, no? Does anyone not? Does anyone not? Great. Okay, so I kind of sidestepped red, black trees when I was at university because it just sounded complicated and there were other ways to balance trees. But I thought this was quite interesting. So for the, for the zero people in the room who don't know what a red, black tree is, it's a self-balancing binary search tree. Each node has an extra bit. And that bit is interpreted as a color. And these colored bits are used to ensure the tree remains approximately balanced during insertions and deletions. OK, so there's a book, maybe some people are aware of it, called Purely Functional Data Structures. And, and Chris, Chris Okasaki in this book makes a couple of points when we're creating red black trees is that there are invariants here no red child no red node has a red child and every path from the root to an empty node contains the same number of black nodes okay so let's try and model this using using adts and you know maybe even before this talk you might start to think about doing something like this so you have some kind of sealed trait called color spelt correctly and this has two different types, okay? It has a red and a black. And I, I just, if you, if you can't read this at the back, I would recommend maybe coming forward or at least looking at the code later because this is going to get a little bit involved. Um, and, you know, the, this, is, this, this is just parameterized. You know, we, we don't care what our tree is going to hold, but all we care is that we've got red things and black things, okay? And then we have another ADT as well for trees. Yep. So a tree is either empty, much like we saw an empty list earlier, which would be nil, or on the none side of an option. But then, of course, it could be a tree as well. And what's a tree? Well, a tree is two, two trees, which are its children. So we've got the left and the right, and then it's got an element, and the element is marked with this color. Okay? So then what we could do is, well, the color, the color is kind of useful only within the context of this tree. So... We don't want our, our abstraction to leak. We don't want to be using reds and blacks outside of this. So well, we can fold the color with the way we've just seen. So we have a function called fold. 
and it takes two, two, two higher order function. Uh, it's a higher order function which takes two parameters as functions. Both of them have the same type, which is from A to X, but the difference here is, you know, one's for the one's for a red element and one's for a black element. So if we ever wanted to go from some element to a different value, then we could implement it like this. And then we can add a helper here, is that if we just want to escape from our, our red and black prison, we can just fold with the identity function, and that will just give us whatever was, whether it was red or black, the, the value that was held inside. Okay, so a useful operation for the red black tree is well is is a given element in the tree. You know, there's, there's nothing too too taxing here. So this would be maybe a uh, appropriate definition. So we want to see if this element a is in our tree of a, and then we have a type class here for how the tree is ordered. You know, we don't care how it's ordered. That's someone else's job but we need to know that it's ordered. And then this is just going to return true or false, okay? So clearly, if the tree is empty, element's not in the tree. If the tree's not empty, well, if, if the element we're looking for is less than the current element, then go to the left, otherwise go to the right. If it's greater than, if neither of these, then we're obviously equal, so this is true. And notice here, we've called this LM, which is where our fold was hidden as well, okay? And then inserting an element into a tree, okay? So this, this will get a little bit more involved. So this would be a signature for this, very similar. We want to insert this element into this tree, and this is how the ordering works in this tree. And we're going to have an inner function here, which I've just called ins, and we're, we're going to use this in a recursive way. So we deal with the tree we've got, if, it's, if, it, if, we're, if we're an empty tree, then we can just put this element here and return that. Yep, hopefully that makes sense. The children of this new tree are both empty. And then here, this is where the fun starts. So this looks very similar to the previous slide. If the element we're looking at is less than the element in the tree, then insert on the left. If it's greater than, insert on the right, otherwise we're equal, we're in the tree, and so we, we, can be, we can be pure here and not change anything and just return the tree. And then here, we're, we're going to keep the tree balanced. And this is where the fun starts, okay? And then we just kick off this, calling this function here inside our insert method. So balancing the tree, okay? We need to turn trees that look like this into trees that look like this, okay? These are the invariants, and they don't hold in this case, and they do here. Invariant, no red, red, no red node has a red child. Well, clearly that's not true here. So when we are doing our insertion, we might get into a state like this. And there's four, there's four cases. So this is one of them, and then where this value is here, and then when the whole tree is flipped, and then there's two for those as well. And if you can't see at the back, this element is called Z, this element is called Y, and this element is called X. And then we assume that these subtrees are all balanced, and these subtrees are called A, B, C, and D. And I point that out because this is going to get very involved very soon, and these are the variables we're going to be using. Okay? So, how do we balance? And we're good programmers, and we want to do things in a pure way, and we want to make reuse where possible. And so this could be a signature for our function. It's balance, and we want to balance this tree with this element, okay? So we've got two trees, and that's, it's kind of, this is like the, the broken down tree, yeah? So we've got a left child and a right child and the color here, and then we want to make sure that this all is correct and that we end up with a tree. So we'll just put this in a tuple, and we're going to match on this tuple, okay? And we're going to deep down dive into our pattern matching, okay? So if we've got a tree where it's a, yeah, so we've got the diagram here, okay? So this pattern matching represents this tree, okay? So we've got, uh, we've got a tree on the left, and we've got D, the tree on the right, 
and then the element here is black, which is Z, and then this tree has uh, an element X and C, and then this X has A's and B's as its children. Okay? The reason I point this out, you'll see in a second. And then what we can do is we can just simply use our decomposed pattern matching to create a tree which meets the invariance that looks something like this. Okay? Hopefully this is this is you know this is hard work for, for the time of the conference, but yeah, hopefully this is making a bit of sense. Okay? So we've gone from this to this, and we've done it using the elements that already exist. If we didn't need to create new trees, we didn't, and we're using purely functional data structures in order to do this. And then there are the four other cases. So this was another layout of that tree, and this was yet another, and the fourth here. And the thing to point out is these elements on the right are all exactly the same, okay? And then if, if we're trying to pattern match and it, none of these work, then actually our tree's already balanced. Okay, so it was a bit taxing maybe, a bit, bit hard work for Friday afternoon, but that's just a really nice use of lots of different pieces of Scala, including ADTs, but really leaning on what pattern matching is good for as well. And so... That's really what I wanted to talk about today. So, well, just to kind of recap what we did, is that well, we looked at what it means for a type to be algebraic, and then we explored some of these common, these common types and implementations that already exist. We introduced folding, and then we've created this new collection type. And hopefully we could see that this could be quite interesting to use in having a nice balanced tree without having to kind of do much of the heavy lifting of balancing that you might find in, say, an object-oriented language as well. So that's all I had to talk about. So thank you for listening. Thank you for sticking around. And um, I hope it was useful. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Otherwise, I think we're done. Questions? No? Let's enjoy the weekend, yeah? Thanks, thanks for sticking around. And um, I'll, see you, I'll see you around. Cheers. Thanks, Noel.